Good afternoon. Welcome to today's Culture Matters webinar, the second in a three-part series on building inclusive workplace culture in times of crisis and beyond. My name is Lawrence Bowdish. My pronouns are he, him, and his, but right now I'm playing the role of my friend and colleague, Kate Glantz, whose pronouns are she, her, and hers. She is the Senior Director of Economic Opportunity and Empowerment at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. In her role, she works with the private sector on initiatives that advance economic opportunity, for marginalized and underserved communities. Today, we're covering the topic of workplace culture, both how to create and sustain that culture for distributed teams, as we are experiencing right now, but also how to build a more resilient and inclusive culture as we navigate through a public health pandemic and a pandemic of systemic racism in our nation and around the world. Before I hand it over to our moderator, I want to acknowledge something that was mentioned during last week's webinar as well. These types of solutions don't allow for one size fits all approach. Creating inclusion and equity within our organizations will require all of us in a position to do so, to use our voice and privilege to advocate and create more inclusive ways of doing business. It will require learning and possibly some unlearning, but you're in the right place. And wherever you are on your journey, welcome, and we're glad you're here with us. A quick housekeeping note, all the participants are muted, but we do want you to submit your questions through the GoToWebinar chat function, which you'll find in the toolbar on the right. To those who submitted questions when you registered, thank you. We've tried to incorporate as many of those into our conversation as we can. And we'll get through as many of them as we can before our scheduled end time of three o'clock. Today's presentation will be recorded and archived on the Chamber Foundation website. We're gonna share that link with you tomorrow and a follow-up email that will also include a survey so we can continue this work in an effective manner. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Lily Gingas, who will guide today's conversation. Lily is the Chief Community Technology Officer at the Cape Poor Center. Lily, take it away. Great, thank you so much. First and foremost, thank you to all of you who are online joining us today across the US. My name is Lily Gangas, uh, she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Chief Technology Community Officer at the Caper Center. You may be wondering, what is the Caper Center? Well, we Caper Center, we focus boldly on closing gaps of access across all sectors, leveraging technology to reimagine STEM education, intersectional research, venture capital, and partnerships. All of this at the intersection of racial justice, tech, and community. So the times that we're living in now, we've been ready for this. And we hope, and I hope that today I get to share some of those insights with you. So today's topic is one that so many organizations are scrambling to get right, to be honest. While in the midst of a global pandemic that has physically separated us by sheltering in place. And the Black Lives Matter movement in our communities that is also being scaled, bringing forth change and dialogue in many different mediums. So is this a turning point? Is this the opportunity to reimagine and build truly inclusive workplaces the right way? Are organizations generally addressing systemic biases and racism, to put it blank, in the workplace that many generations in the past have endured? And keeping in mind that we are still in a global pandemic and facing some of the worst economic downturns in past generations, where the delivery of basics need to, are in need of digital reimagining. Personally, I remember being in corporate America as a software engineer um, and then moved to innovation consulting, both in the public and private sector. And for years, I knew that talking about race or even workplace culture sometimes felt like PR statements. And especially working in classified environments for me meant that working from home was simply not possible. How would I have adopted in, this, in these times? I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, despite being in this workplace for over 16 years, it feels like much has changed since that first job. As a young employee resource group leader, um, I face the same challenges that I hear some of my Black and Latinx ERG leaders, community members hear about and what they're struggling with. But the time is up and it has to be going different. And I truly believe that it can be possible. So today's conversation, we'll get to do a deep dive on what that entails with amazing financial tech leaders that ever find the Molly Fuel, who will share how they are adapting and learning forward in these current times. So let's get started and learn forward. So please welcome me, uh, please join me in welcoming the amazing panelists for today. Jesse Bridges, SVP Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at EverFi. Kate Herman, Director of Learning and Development at The Molecule. Hi Kate and, and Jesse, how are you all doing today? Great. Doing well, Lily. Let's, 
let's get started. What what times are we in? And so let's jump right in. How do you contribute to shaping an inclusive culture at your organization, especially now in these times where remote teams are really in the midst of two intersections, uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the anti-Blackness? What does an inclusive culture entail? This is a question that so many organizations and so people online want to learn more about. So why don't we start with you, Jesse? Sure, and thanks, Lily. Thank you for that really kind introduction and and also um, just the, the context that you set for the moment that we're in. When we first started this conversation, it was very much centered on how is the dispersed workforce as impacted by COVID-19, how is that driving inclusive culture? And you're right, and you named it very specifically, um, that we're now dealing with two, and I would say possibly three crises at the same time. There's a continued impact of COVID-19, and there's the financial impact that is a result of that, in addition to the national and now international um, protests and civil unrest that are happening as a result of long, long acknowledged racial inequities um, and violence. And so, um, you know, before we get started, if you all can afford me just one moment, um, there is a practice that people at my company have started to adopt. Um, and I really drive forward as a way to acknowledge the moment that we're in, um, but then also to acknowledge where we are as individuals coming into this moment. And it's a meditative practice called taking a moment to arrive. Um, because every person who's on this call right now, who is tuning into this webinar, you have created the space to do so. Um, and there is a swirl of information, things that we have named and so many more that you are contending with um, that, that are drawing away your attention. And so if we can just, as, as a collective, take a moment to arrive, to ground ourselves in this conversation, to be able to learn forward, as you, as you said, and I really appreciate that phrase. Um, I think that can help us drive this conversation in a way that feels like a dialogue, that feels ultimately helpful, and then also feels really human in acknowledging that, again, we are all coming to this from very different perspectives and, and our attention is split in 3,000 different ways. And so just one moment um, for us to ground ourselves together, and then we can talk more deeply about inclusive workplace cultures. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so, you, you know, to answer your question, Lily, I think there are lots of directions that we can go in. And as you said, leaders, individual contributors, people managers are struggling with the idea and have historically um, grappled with the idea of what does an inclusive workplace culture look like. And I think that there are two um, context specific, but then also very durable concepts. Um, that we want to acknowledge and lift up. The first is around programs that, um, that meet that need of feeling a sense of connection and belonging. And I think particularly in this moment, I've seen programs being lifted up, creating spaces and forums of support and of dialogue are critically important. Um, and, and the messaging and the signaling from leaders internally um, to acknowledge that everybody is bringing elements of their full selves to work. And before that was nomenclature within the diversity, equity, inclusion world, that we wanna create a workplace where everyone can bring their full selves to work. And that's even more so the case now that where you work, where you live and where you teach your children is in the same environment. Um, you know, so that, uh, that, that, that conversation that we had at the beginning of this webinar that I might have to elbow my five-year-old very gently <laughs> out of the way, you know, those are, those are elements of, of bringing our full selves to work and acknowledging the lived experiences outside of the work walls, virtual or physical, that are impacting how you show up. Um, I think those, those programs of discussion and dialogue are remarkably relevant now. Um, programs like EAP resources to provide psychological safety and the counseling and support that folks need as they're contending with um, all of the information and all of the impact and how they feel physically safe in the workplace. All of those are really relevant. And as you talk about culture, we also have to acknowledge in addition to programs, which feels very front of stage, if you will, um, folks like myself have been in the position to work within the system to change the system for quite some time now. And you hear that narrative happening and you can see the trend lines on places like LinkedIn and other social media that in addition to the programs and the messages of support 
to truly inculcate a culture of inclusion, you have to investigate your practices, your policies, your protocols, and how people come into your organization, how they're oriented to your organization, how they're trained on cultural expectations and value alignment, um, but then also how do you advance your organization forward to demonstrate a day-to-day -day operational um, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so again, I kind of lift up programs is one that is really relevant now um, and the sustainable practice of investigating your policies, your programs, and your, po and, and your protocols to ensure that we're managing our biases, that we're creating equitable places of, of work and community. Um, and Kate, I'd love to hear your perspective on that as well. Thank Thanks you. So much. And thank you, Lily, also for the for the wonderful and warm welcome. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here today with the two of you and um, so much of what you've both said resonates with me as well. Um, I work at The Motley Fool, which is a financial services company based in Alexandria, Virginia, but we're actually a global company. We have offices um, all, all the way down to Australia and around the world. So um, we, we were used to, prior to this, we were used to a distributed workforce. We were used to working across time zones and sort of meeting people where they live, literally and figuratively. And now, over the past few months, as you both have said, um, the new normal, which is a phrase I don't love, but works here. Um, I think within a week, somebody said, we're never gonna see our colleagues the same way ever again, now that we've seen all of their home spaces, now that we've seen who they are as parents when their kids run in, now that we've seen how they respond when the dog barks at the postman, you know. Um, I think we at The Motley Fool have um, embraced for a long time the notion of bringing your whole self to work. So Jesse, thank you for saying that as well. And for us, um, you can't hear it when we say it, but everything has a fool angle and fool is capitalized and full of respect and love. Um, it is not a derogatory term. And so we talk about embracing each other's foolishness and bringing our whole selves to work. And we, we talk often about how conversations are richer and work is stronger um, when everybody is able to bring their expertise and experience to the table. Um, we have a leadership program that does include unconscious bias training, um, how to take and receive feedback gracefully. Um, we've partnered with a company called Tequitable. I don't know if you're familiar, but um, they're, they're uh, a minority founded and owned company that um, we've partnered with to provide fools with an, with an opportunity if they do come up against a, a situation where they think there may be discrimination or bias in play or somebody has given them feedback that maybe they have been the perpetrator of the bias or, or um, possible wrongdoing there. Techwitable is an outlet for any fool um, to go. You can share your own experience and get one-to-one -one kind of feedback on it, or you can just read up. There's a whole resource library um, and resources there. So those were already in place, EAP also. And what we have found is we're having different levels of conversation around that foolishness and individuality. Um, we've had a lot of open conversations about mental health in the past few months that I don't think we would have seen as openly um, prior to the pandemic. And now with the past two or three weeks of intensity in our society, I think it's just leveled up from there. The, the real impact that this is having on people. Um, and because we are all at home and all at work and all you know, in, in various levels of responsibility with our own families, um, the other thing that we're aware of is it's hard for folks to find the privacy to use some of these outlets. EAP is available for people to talk to and to feel supported, but maybe they can't get away from their family or housemates to have those conversations. Techwitable is there. so. Um, we are now in a, in a space where employees are creating, creating their own forums to have these conversations. Um, we're power users of the Slack platform and we have subgroups within there that um, have sort of self-identified as fools having this concern or need or experience and people are coming together to lift each other up and, and support each other through this in um, very personal ways, I think. And so I, I personally will be really interested to see how this permanently changes the professional landscape a little bit. I think company to company, it's gonna be very different. Um, I don't think I said right up front, I am the director of learning development at The Fool. So um, a enormous part of my role is just listening to fools about their development experience, about their professional path, about what their blockers are, their opportunities, their challenges. Um, we have a strong peer-to-peer -peer coaching program at the company. We've got almost 40 
um, peer to peer coaches and 450 ish employees. So every pool has a coach um, peer to peer as just an extra person to listen to. But in all of those conversations that I've had, I've, I've done about 220 one on one check ins since mid March. Um, it's just, it's it it is my job, but it's also my um, I'm compelled to do it to just check on people and see how they're doing, and that is very much a part of the culture at the Motley Fool and who we are um, is to make those connections and be sure that people feel like wherever they are, whatever they're experiencing, we're there. And then the other thing I just wanted to toss out real quick, and then back to you, Lily, in the studio. Um, we had a conversation last week. Um, that our Motley Committee pulled together, and that is, you know, we we play on our own name a lot, as you can tell. But the Motley Committee is um, our Dibs Committee: Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Equals Success is how we translate that at our company, and um, it's an employee-led um, group with with two volunteer co-chairs uh, that lead the work of that, with the strong leadership buy-in um, at the company, and. They arranged a forum on Friday afternoon, it was meant to be an hour for people to just sit and talk through the experiences, especially of black fools, but of all fools and how people are processing this. We have fools of all ethnicities that are really wrestling with what's going on. And some of them are having a real moment of reconciliation within themselves or with their families or friends. Many of our fools are out in Washington, DC and Denver, um, out on the streets joining the protests. So, the conversation was meant to be an hour. It ended up going two and a half, led by our CEO in the end. He was sort of the one at the end saying, I'm still here. Anybody wants to talk, I'm still here, which I think says so much about the company's overall commitment. Um, but we were reminded again in, in the course of that conversation that HR, and I believe a lot of our uh, listeners here today are in the HR space, can be seen as maybe not part of the solution, but part of the challenge in these situations. And, and um, we were reminded that no matter how hard we try to get it right at the fool, people also are coming from other companies where they may have not had such wonderful experiences with their HR department or their support teams. And they're not sure who to turn to or who to trust or talk to in a time like this. So the onus is on, on myself and my team to be sure that we are actively, mindfully creating that space of support, um, most especially in a time like this. Thank you, that was long. Lily, back to you. <laughs> Great, I'm like taking notes. Thank you so much. I think you basically, this is the end of the webinar. I hope you all listened because they dropped the mic with all the recommendations that were very actionable um, as well. And there was a few things that I want to kind of tease out a little bit to go into more depth. Um, but I really, what really resonated was the feedback aspect. How does an organization get feedback in a way that's sustainable? So I really like, Jesse, how you put it, a sustainable investigation that's continuous. Because I think that's so important of being able to not as an organization, but also to the individuals, right? And specifically for like you, like um, we are aware that a lot of you um, tuning in today are managers. And so, what what would be your top three to five uh, key takeaways or tools that to a manager that you can say, look, here's here's we know this is challenging. We know that being able to hold space for colleagues in this virtual world may be new for a lot of folks. Some folks have the families have other responsibilities at home what would be your recommendation for these managers to say okay here are at least your, your top three top five uh things to investigate and give yourself feedback as a manager to also provide that support what, what would be those um given where we're at today sure well I, I would love to compile that that list of three to five alongside with kate um so I, I'll, I'll name i'll name a couple and, and Kate would love for you to, to either, you know, build on those or, or add more original ideas. Um, and I think the, the first that I would name is, is to not assume. And that feels overly simplistic, um, but I think has a lot of utility in this, in this moment. Um, thematically, as I've been working alongside organizational leaders, both within EverFi and outside of EverFi, um, the key theme that I am hearing from employees is a need for permission. Mm -hmm. And that way heavy when it comes to workplace and whether that is, I need permission to cry. I need permission to be able to reschedule this meeting because I need a moment. I need permission to log off a little bit early and rearrange my schedule so that I can participate in the moment of silence. I need permission to create this block of time on my calendar to be able to attend 
my child's Zoom class with their teacher. There's this sort of crave for, because we are disconnected, disconnected physically from each other, and there's this confluence of productivity and emotion um, that people are grappling with and trying to find a counterbalance to, <clears throat> I think not assuming that your direct reports know that you are supportive of what they need to do to take care of themselves um, would be, for me, takeaway number one um, is, is to be explicit about your support of them taking care of themselves as a first and foremost. And, and that allows you to enter into a collaborative conversation about what is it, what is it that you need? Um, is it that you need to create blocks of time on your calendar? Is it that you need to be directed to resources that the talent organization or the HR organization can provide for you? And I think that that proactivity of not assuming and asking the question of what is it that you need and how can I best support you in this moment? Because there are an ecosystem of things that you're dealing with um, would be sort of Point step number one. Um, step number two, I think, you, Kate, you named it a little bit earlier about you know this moment of reconciliation and sometimes reckoning, rec reckoning, and also awareness raising of where we have individually stood um, when it comes to being one who can help progress social justice initiatives or not. And, and where do I, you know, where do I stand in this conversation? Um, where do I stand and how flexible I've been as a, as a manager of people when it comes to people previously asking me to work virtually or remotely? Um, I think that there's, there's a moment in time where managers need to understand and explore the identities that drive their own perceptions because how you drive your, your perceptions are shaped by your own lived experiences, by your own identities, the biases and the preferences that we all have. And if left unchecked, um, you know, those are the moments where we start to revise those preferences as mandates in how our employees engage and interact with us. Um, and so again, I think it sounds, it sounds in some ways existential, <laughs> this idea that you explore your identities, that you explore your biases, I think there are probably standardized ways to go about investigating that depending on the learning management system or the access to learning and development that you have within your organization. If there's already sort of a bias training or inclusive awareness or inclusive leadership training, tapping into that. Um, if it's not something that your organization has, asking how do you help create it? Um, there are a good number of resources that are available that have come in just beautifully packaged compendiums <laughs> as of late, excuse me. <clears throat> and so having that conversation about how are we being trained to be attentive and in um, and intentional <clears throat> managers would be the second step. Um, so Kate, I'd love for you to build on those and, and add a few to a few of your own. Yeah, thank you. And and that's beautiful. I, I was actually going to say um, sort of be humble enough to recognize that perception does translate to reality to a certain extent and so to your point about who you are as a leader and how you're seen um, you can have someone who is exceptionally gifted at um, programming or performance or you know metric and data driven analysis that sort of thing and just not quite as engaged on the people side and you can also have the reverse and sort of being aware of um, your role in that as a as a team leader um, and modeling good behavior, I think, is is one to your point about taking time off and and really taking time to take care of yourself. The the lead of my team, our our people team leader Lee Burbage, um, got on Slack a couple of weeks ago and said, "All of you on our team, what day will you be taking off between now and June 6th? Put it here." So there was a little bit of a social accountability among our team that, oh, Kate, you said you weren't working on June 2nd, you better not, you know, and truth be told, I almost forgot to take the day off. So um, the social accountability kicked in when I needed it to. Um, but this notion that you have all the answers because you're leading the team and that if you lay out a protocol or if you lay out um, a suggested way of doing things or everybody be sure you take X amount of time off before a certain time, you have to have the follow through. Mm -hmm. um, we really advocate for one-on-one -on -one, um, check-ins between managers and, and their people. Um, weekly, ideally, every other week, okay. Beyond that, especially now with everyone at home, you start to lose touch with people. You start to disconnect. Imagine if a team lead hadn't had a check-in with somebody in the past two or three weeks. How much have those lives changed? How much of those circumstances have changed? How different is that employee 
feeling and performing and responding and reacting, right? I mean, it's just night and day. And I think to your point, if you, uh, you know, Jesse, if, if you bring that bias um, of, well, this is what I assume their experience is because of what I know of them, because of what they look like, because of what I've heard them talk about, because of the Slack channels they've been active or vocal in, you don't know until you talk to them. So I think that is my number one is you have to talk to people. Um, so we'll call that number three and a half, Jesse. <laughs> um, and I think listening is the other one. Um, when when folks at work will ask me sort of what, I'm a new manager, what do you think I should focus on? Which skill should I sharpen? Listening, active listening. So not just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no. Um, if you're Lily, you're taking notes and referring back to things. If you're me, you're just sort of tracking it through and telling a story. That's the former journalist in me that's kind of weaving it all together. I think um, really putting yourself in their shoes, feeling their experience, you got to dig deep for your empathy if you're going to be a successful um, voice in, in inclusion. I think you really have to find a way, whether it's just reading as much as you can, listening as much as you can to the people around you to really find a way to see yourself in their shoes a little bit as you talk through their experience and what they need. Um, I think that really is is the best way um, to build a truly inclusive uh, company or community. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. So just for the folks who are taking some notes, I'll share my notes with you all. Uh, some key strategies. Do not assume. Be explicit with your employees so then that way you can open the dialogue. Have the managers also un themselves understand, understand yourself, where are you coming from, your own perceptions. On that end, be humble, practice active listening. And then the last one that I really, really loved was having the social accountability that starts with the leaders, the leaders mm -hmm. themselves modeling this behavior because it is tough for everyone. And I think that that's one of the parts that I really hope that the silver lining of all of this is that we can all connect more as humans um, and being able to also see the other silver lining of all of this. There's so many tools and resources that have been, been created for years. Now folks are like, where are they, where are they? And so we'll share some, some of those after this call um, and plug for the Caper Center because there's a lot of great research there as well that we've done on, on a lot of this work. Um, and, Techquitable is great. I do have to disclose they're a caper capital company, so I'll stop there. <laughs> there it is. Okay. <laughs> of technology and tools and resources really coming in the, this space. Um, but I want to go back to the model and behavior, specifically for the leadership, because I think that that this is a part where a lot of folks who maybe are middle managers are struggling. Maybe some of the younger employees are also struggling if they don't see themselves reflected in the leadership, or if the leadership it's not. Uh, is giving canned answers like how do we how do we make sure that the inclusive leadership is really inclusive, especially now uh, where we need everybody on deck to be resilient to come through this together. So um, I'll throw it to um, both of you out there. What what why is inclusive leadership so critical in these times? Kate, would you would you like to go first? Would you like me to go first? Go ahead, Jesse. I'll follow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. I, I can enter in and then we can we can build together. Um, but I do want to go back to two two points. One point ago, just in terms of the, the punch list of things that we're recommending for leaders to do. And this is in alignment with inclusive leadership, and then we'll get to the importance of why leadership needs to be inclusive. Um, there is there is some operational just best practices when it comes to creating inclusive meetings. And um, I had the privilege of, of creating an infographic years and years and years ago um, with a, a group of colleagues around creating inclusive meetings. And there was this very specific line item about, well, you don't forget the person who's on the phone. Mm -hmm. We're all on the phone. <laughs> um, and so, so the operational, very non-existential, but you can go do today is, is start to, if you're not already, start to create agendas for your meetings that you send out at least 24 hours in advance. So any meeting that you have, whether it's a recurring meeting or one that is ad hoc and you're doing some deep dive, create an agenda 
and the objectives of what you want to achieve during that meeting because we are all over meeting at this point in time we are all contending with the multiple webexes and zooms and go to meetings that we're managing throughout the day for not just ourselves but the other people in our household and so having the opportunity where you create an agenda so people know what to walk into and expect as the outcome of the meeting provides the person who is more introverted and needs more time to process, the time to plan what they would like to contribute to that meeting. And then also what you can do as that first line item is a two minute check-in, sort of a two minute well-being check-in um, for everybody in the meeting to say, you know, we just wanna see how folks are doing. And there might be some things that come out of that. So I think meeting management and meeting hygiene, while it feels remarkably operational, can be a, a, a remarkably po profound act of inclusion, especially when you have a distributed workforce and folks are coming to the space where they, do, they need that moment to arrive. But again, it, it allows everyone to kind of enter in the space in a level playing field on what to expect, what to contribute, um, and, and how things will flow in the use of their time. So that is, just add that one to the list. Um, <laughs> And, and then, you know, moving into your question about why is inclusive leadership important? I think we've outlined the business case for diversity um, for years now. And, and, and we focused on not only the moral imperative, it's the right thing to do, which it certainly is, um, but also looking at what are the comparative advantages of organizations that focus on diversity and their levels of leadership and management. And you see time and again, um, outperformance in lots of ways, whether that is financial performance, whether that is, um, you know, market production of novelty. Um, but the one that I'll, I'll center on pretty specifically, mostly because I just read a research study about it, is the idea of innovation. Um, in the time of COVID-19, where we have evolving, consistently shifting information, timelines of return to office keep getting postponed or re revised, um, we are making decisions, long-term decisions, mid-term decisions in the absence of complete information. And you see headline after headline focusing on the need for innovation to be able to plan through um, both the COVID crisis, through the social unrest, and what are we going to look like on the other side of this, whatever the other side of this looks like. Um, and and based on that research study that I, that I just read a couple of days ago, um, what they found in that study, and I can pass it along as a resource, um, was focusing on PhD students in the sciences, in the, in the hard sciences. And what they were finding was that PhD students who came from underrepresented racial backgrounds produced scientific novelty at a statistically significant higher rate than their white counterparts. However, because of institutionalized biases, they were offered full time faculty positions at a lower rate and the novelty produced in their research was taken up at a lower rate than their white counterparts. And so if we as a business, as an organization, are craving innovation and new ideas to push on the edges to work our way through and navigate through um, this, these crises, we need innovative mindsets. And so that's where the practice of bringing together a multitude of perspectives that will drive that innovation not just having representation, but then also creating the table where everybody's mic is on and everybody has equal airtime, that becomes critically important from a performance perspective. Um, if, you need, if you need innovation, you've got to bring diversity together. You have to have um, that formula of inclusion alongside with it. Um, and then, you know, in that way, we also recognize, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were in a talent war. Organizations were looking for top talent and this generation of workers, and we're in one of the most multi-generational workforces in our history, um, this generation of work, workers and employees are looking for the marriage and the equitable marriage of your community engagement efforts, what you say you're doing in your community to do good, and are you treating your internal community just as well? And so they are focusing on that brand recognition of social good and social justice. Um, and so it is certainly one thing to you know, put out a statement and to feel affirmative outside of your walls and to invest in um, employee matching programs for charitable donations, which is a good thing to do, but not to marry that alongside internal investigations of your practices. And do we have representation and are we giving voice to um, a culture of inclusion 
um, it becomes a brand, it becomes a reputation, a reputational risk when it comes to cultivating the talent and keeping the talent that you want within your organization. Thank you so much, Jesse. Kate, um, can you build upon upon then? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I I want to acknowledge too that I think um, having uh, leaders at the company who are supportive of inclusion, who are um, active allies in that, I think is important. Obviously, um, I want to acknowledge that it's not always as easy or um, as quick of of a development as companies might like. And so, where there's there's great intention, sometimes the execution can take a little while. And I think um, the process is worth it, right? The conversations and the intentions and the outcome, as Jesse said, the the richness um, in performance and innovation and and other factors is, I'm going to say, unquestioned at this point based on the research that's out there. So, um, I think if if there are folks that are tuned in today who see a deficit in their own leadership um, in terms of um, diversity of any kind. I think now is a very good time to be looking at that. And, and maybe it starts with thinking through how, how did our leadership landscape get to this point and who's coming, who's, who's coming up next? And are we creating the opportunities as equally as we can be? And are, and are we doing that? And I know um, at The Fool we have, um, our recruiting team has sort of built a, a new model um, earlier this year for just making sure that there's a systematic effort to, to create those opportunities and to at least get candidates in the door. Um, and Jesse, I know Everfi is also in the financial space and Lily, technically tech too. I mean, there there um, tend to be some sectors in in the economy where it tends to be very majority white. And I think um, finding ways to create opportunities and to recruit differently and to market differently, to be sure that that the attraction is there, I think is really important. Um, for the fool, inclusion is, is as much about diversity of thought and diversity of background and diversity of skill set. Um, but against today's backdrop, it just has a completely different and, and stronger focus um, at the moment. And so I think um, we're among hundreds of companies right now that are that are looking to be sure that, as Jesse and Lily have said, that we're finding ways to make those opportunities and to really bring inclusion full circle. Um, it's a long road, but a worthwhile one to walk. <laughs> Love, love every everything that you both said, and and as my active listening, I am taking notes, and I just want to read, <laughs> and I just coming the the themes of assessing your own leadership at your own company, and and I love what you just said, Kate, of like who is coming up next, and Jesse, your point of reputational risk for anybody that is does have especially trained in the traditional MBA or uh, models, we have this next generation that is something that we haven't seen before. And they are naturally so empowered, growing up with the most information at their fingertips in any generation. So we have this opportunity to really unlock and foster that growth. And that's actually what gives me a lot of hope in, in all sectors for innovation, especially as uh, as we start to go into where, we, where, we're, where we're gonna start to see the demographic shift, right, in 2040. Um, and some of these issues that we're seeing in the streets are also folks who don't want to accept that the, the US has changed. And it's going to change. And I think that having leadership that understands and is supportive is critical in these times. So I'm gonna um I have two more questions and I'm gonna check on the 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 folks that are listening in. So please um drop in your questions, but I'm gonna switch up a little bit. So I'm gonna I wanna dig in a little bit more into the learning and development, Kate. And then Jesse, I wanna I'll come back to you on specifically on retention. I think that that's a key discussion. So Kate, specifically on the learning development, so, so we all wanna learn forward. And we're all, um, as Jesse mentioned, this is the the workforce that has the most generations in one space. And now we're in adapting to new ways of working together. I, I, I believe that the Molly Fool has the golden rule. Can you explain a little bit more, more what that is about? How does it intersect with learning and development priorities? Absolutely. Um, and I will just say to your to your previous point, I've heard from our recruiters that um, talking of this generation and, and the new folks coming up, uh, 
it seems as though candidates now are very forward in saying, what are you doing about diversity at your company? What are your programs for inclusion? How do you make sure everyone's voice is heard? What do you, and so that is a turning of the tables a little bit, I think, and, and the expectation is there on the part of the candidates that your company is going to be not just verbally committed, but actively programmatically deeply committed to, to the efforts here. So I just, that's just something interesting that I had heard a couple of weeks ago that felt relevant. The golden rule at The Fool, a couple of years ago, um, our co-founders, Tom and David Gardner, who are brothers, um, the company was founded um, 26, 27 years ago. And a few years ago, they sat back to take stock about where the company had come. Were, were we the company that they had wanted to grow when they first started out a couple of decades ago? And as they assessed, the good news was yes. Um, they were very proud of the company. They were proud of the culture. Um, we're often named a best place to work in the area. Um, the, the culture is very, very strong. I'm gonna say, especially for a financial services company, but for in any kind of company, it's just unlike anywhere I've ever been. On reflection, what they realized was part of why we were so successful and such a wonderful place was because a lot of our interactions were um, almost unconsciously driven by the golden rule, the one we all learned in preschool, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's as complicated as it gets. Um, but ever the innovators, uh, the gardeners decided to top it and they decided to take the standard golden rule that we all know and mindfully apply it to our four key stakeholders at the time. So it was our members who consume our content, our employees, our prospects that we're trying to reach and our share owners. We have uh, private shares. We're not a publicly traded company, but it's an employee owned. Um, what would it look like if we applied that principle to all of the conversations and decisions that affect those four major stakeholder groups? So, for instance, on the um, member golden rule, it's um, making sure our members are in the right services for their needs at that time. Uh, we have a broad array of services that we could offer to people. The golden rule at the pool would mandate that we make sure every member is in the right service. So if somebody calls into our customer service team, which we call member services, and it turns out they haven't logged in in five years, but they've been continuing to pay their membership fee or their subscription fee, the right thing to do is hit pause and talk to them about how they're using the service or not and what might be a better fit for them. For employees, um, trust one another is one of them. Embrace foolishness is one of them. Um, for our prospects, it's about um, respecting their time uh, and using a variety of tools to reach them where they are in their investing journey. Um, and for the share owners, it's it's along the lines of transparency, making sure all of our share owners are aware of our financial health and where we're going as a company, what new initiatives we're taking. So if you apply that lens, it might sound a little hokey at first, but if you really do apply it in that way, it's shocking to see that a private company can still be profitable and be doing well in their community and be doing well by their employees. Um, it goes back to the conscious capitalism philosophy of, you know, you, you can accomplish both things and, and Tom and David are both very active in that. So um, part of the golden rule writ large in that way means we all have to be continually bringing ourselves up to speed. We all have to know about the inner workings of the company. We need to know about the latest campaign and how it's doing and why. We need to know um, about the work that, that the others are doing. We need to be aware of that tension that's in the golden rule can you equally satisfy all four stakeholders at the same time? Rarely, rarely. Um, there's always going to be some push and pull to meet prospects at the right time. Maybe it means doing an after hours, um, you know, live chat experience that you put at maybe 9 p.m. Eastern to try to reach the most people around the world. It's great for prospects. Ultimately, it's probably good for share owners. How is it for the employees that have to be in the studio or now at home with their families? You know, we've, if if the CEO's in the studio, we've got a couple analysts supporting, we've got the lawyer on standby, we've got all sorts of people who would need to be part of those experiences. And so it's an acknowledgement that everything has a compromise. Um, and that informs a lot of the work that we do. Um, our learning and development efforts, we have um, passes to LinkedIn learning so that we can send fools in that direction to brush up on skill sets or what have you, but we do most of our leadership training in-house. Um, we have a program called the Fool Fellowship, which is, um, it runs every couple of years and we only take about 10 to 12 fools at a time um, from all corners of the company and um, typically a very diverse cohort of fools um, to really make it a richer experience. And um, they hear from leaders around the company for the first week, just conversations like this, no slides, no presentations, no homework, 
just conversations with peers um, about different parts. And then the um, cornerstone of the experience is a learning trip. And we go to a different city and meet with leaders at other companies that we respect and admire, um, usually C-suite, but on down as well, because there's, there's learnings to be had everywhere. So we do that. We do unconscious bias. We teach the feedback class. Um, we have a new manager cohort for fools that are becoming managers for the first time. Um, currently at home, we're enjoying a class uh, or a series where fools are teaching other fools. Um, and we used to have a more robust program called Fool You that leveraged that where fools with a certain skill set would teach their class anything from butchering to photography to um, copywriting. I mean, it, it really was a span. And now that we're all at home, uh, we have, I think this week we have a crocheting class coming online again to build community and just sort of leverage the skills that we have. But um, we also have people who teach about writing effective headlines and um, that sort of thing. So just leveraging the the common, um, the knowledge base that you have right in your own company, you'd be stunned. Maybe you wouldn't be. I occasionally am still stunned at just the breadth of expertise that fools can share with each other. And I'm sure you all have that at your companies as well. Love that, love that. I love that where creativity has a space. Um, mm -hmm. the, the integrated strategy, a very holistic, but also multimodal approach to the learning and development. So thank you so much for sharing that, Kate. And for Jesse, sure. I'm also I'm looking at the clock because I do want to take one question from the audience. Um, but Jesse, specifically on the retention, because that's a part that a lot of times we don't get to discuss, especially now, right? As we're like, yes, get in, get in uh, the talent, get them onboarded, but there's also this path of what, where is the, the next level? How do we foster the next generation to be coming up? And specifically with your approach, I'm curious to learn, what is your, your honest look at the end-to-end -end employee experience? And is retention the metric that we should be actually looking at? Um, you can share a little bit more of your insight of how you approach uh, the retention um, experience. Sure, sure. Um, there, and actually, I'm, I'm going to build on a lot of what Kate said um, because the elements of how you approach that are baked into your response. And so, if I can sort of draw out the insights, um, there's there's a practice of a culture design session. And, and that's the review that it sounds like the Motley Fool went through when it was, you know, if I, apply, if I apply the lens of the golden rule to every aspect of what we do, if I were to design my culture of how we do business through that lens, um, I'm going to come out with a different set of expectations, behaviors, processes, policies. And so in that way, there's a moment where a company decides, and, and I was a part of a company previously that decided we are going to sit down as an entire company and have a series of opt-in focus groups, focus group discussions where we take each part of our company and whether that's how we engage with members or how we engage with each other or what does the physical environment at that point in time our office look like and put it through the lens of if we want to be a best in class company seven years from now, what do we need to do differently? And so, you know, on the point of retention, while it feels adjacent to that, every element of your company's culture is a retention tactic. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the job of retention is seen as resting on the shoulders of your HR department, of your L&D person, um, and certainly they have a part to play. But until every person in your organization sees themselves as an ambassador for culture that will retain the best, most inclusive, diverse workforce, then you're only going to get partway there. If you're leaning solely on tactics like um, hypo development programs, you're only going to get halfway there. And those are, again, certainly a good portion of it. Um, you know, we at, we at EverFi, we have a similar program. Um, it's, it's called the Academy. And in that way, we've said if this is the succession management um, tactic and the leadership development investment who are going to be our next generation of leaders, well, we have to be very intentional about that nomination process. And it's not just, oh, well, you know, we pick the five leaders in the company and everyone says this is who should be up next. Um, but we look at those competencies that you're evaluated against. What are the leadership competencies that we're evaluating for? And we're designing and redesigning the inclusive leadership competency now. And so in that way, um, one, of, one of the initiatives as a part of, of that is that we, we took the entire cohort, not this year, obviously, but in previous years, we would take them down to the Equal Justice Initiative um, in mm -hmm. Alabama. 
because the work that EverFi does is very much focused on and has been since its inception focused on closing generational wealth gaps. That's where we started. And that's why we created financial literacy programs for K through 12 students. And then we said, well, we can't ignore the internal community that these companies are providing um, literacy for. And so um, there's a workplace training element to that, but we needed those emerging leaders to understand why we do the work that we do. That it's not simply about financial literacy. It's not about um, simply providing an unconscious bias training course it is that we are trying to address systems of inequity through scalable digital education. But but to do that, you've got to understand at your core um, the why. And I, I oftentimes look at Simon Sinek's golden circle of the why, the how, and the what. And you start with the why. Um, and so I think connecting each person in your company to your why and how what you're doing is advancing the organization forward towards your mission and your vision is, is certainly this, the space um, to be in. And then also there are those development programs. Um, you know, some are more elaborate where they're for, your, for folks who've only been in the organization for a year or less and they go up and some of them it's that singular investment program. Um, but being very intentional about the process of who is a part of those um, those experiences and making sure that it's representative not only of the organization that you have now, but the organization that you want um, is, is one of those retention levers as well. Um, and I think the employee is going to see their organization through the lens of their managerial experience. Mm -hmm. And so time and time again, I'm on the phone with organizations and what they are saying to me is, how do we how do we help how do we support managers and i think that's the right question to be asking um, what is the wraparound support that we provide to individual managers and people leaders who are new who have developed really good habits and some of them who have habits that they need to unlearn um, but i think you know as a retention tactic um, there is an investment in managers and managing equitably um, that needs to be taught, supported, skill built, and, and there's accountability around that. Um, so I think I've answered it in a variety of ways, but retention can't rest on your HR employees. That's, you know, that's the key takeaway. It has to be that every person is an ambassador of culture that then leads to inclusion. Um, and then there are specific tactics that are supported by, by programs and, and, and policies and procedures that it's an all encompassing um, phrase that I really like that actually one of my previous supervisors gifted to me is that diversity isn't a thing you do, it's how you do all things. And that is um, an overarching driving way to think about a culture of inclusion that is in and of itself a retention tactic for, for all of your employees. I love that. Inclusion is how you do all things. I hope you're taking notes, tweeting it out, and sharing it broadly. Um, and just see briefly, I know we have uh, about a few minutes left, but I did want to take a one question from the audience, specifically on, on, on this topic of how you do all things. So I'll just read it really briefly. Um, I mean, Jesse or Kate, whoever is willing to do a pop-up style, please uh, give me a one, one minute answer on this. Um, but I'll just read it now. It says, our CEO mentioned maybe having a meeting guideline to make sure that each meeting has a diverse representation to promote diversity and inclusiveness among employees. How would you approach this guideline to avoid making employees feel like they're the token person representing the diversity of the firm? So why don't we, Jesse, you feel comfortable answering? I can start, I can start. Uh, not always good on the fly. I'm an introvert posing as an extrovert, so I needed the meeting. <laughs> just when we began. Okay. Applause, <laughs> you're doing great. <laughs> Tokenization, uh, how do we avoid that in, the, in these times as well? <laughs> Um, you know, so so in that way, um, it's it's funny. I, I I wrote a piece. I wrote a blog recently, and um, and that was actually one of the tactics on um, inclusive leadership and, and the blueprint for inclusive leadership was to in every meeting you designate someone as better term for this, but the devil's advocate. So someone who is designated to push on consensus. Um, because oftentimes when you're in these group settings, even if you have a diverging opinion, social norming would say, if everybody else thinks this way, I'm going to reserve that thought. But if you designate someone with the agenda 24 hours in advance, what you're tackling, and you designate someone in a rotational style because no one wants to be the naysayer all of the time to say, 
we want you and we are giving you permission and we are asking you to provide a 180 degree perspective on what we've come to agreement on. One, everybody knows going in that we want that push and pull, we want that tension of pushing on consensus um, because it's going to get us to a better conclusion. It's going to illuminate blind spots on the back end. Um, and then also that person has the, the time to prepare um, to be in that position because it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, not that devil's advocacy and 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 diversity are, are one and the same but oftentimes when you're one of the sole representatives in a group you you have that sensation i've had that sensation of oh everybody agrees and i have this one thought that i want to say but i just don't want to be that person today right but when you're designating someone into that role providing them permission and then creating a space where you fail forward and you provide the psychological safety to provide opposing opinions and insights. Um, that would be one way to operationalize that. That was more than a minute. I apologize. The, love it, love it, great. Thank you so much. Kate, anything to add on that? Um, I was just gonna layer in, I think um, we're we're trying to be more mindful a little bit um, in recent months about how many meetings we have, as you referred, like we've got online fatigue and, and how many meetings do we have and to your point about agendas. Um, the other thing is, we're asking people to sort of audit who's being invited to the meetings and why. And so I think that could go a long way in helping managers start to internalize this responsibility to be sure that they're not creating token opportunities, to your point, Lily, but that they're really holistic, intentional opportunities. Um, why are you inviting this person to the meeting? What role do you want them to serve? What what contributions are you expecting or hoping for from them? Um, so I think that is is a way to start coaching managers or, or meeting organizers to really start thinking through not only do these three people need to be here but why should that one person be here or to you know what i mean sort of really get um deep and then jesse the other thing i want to say is to your point that um you have this idea and it's a dissenting thought and you don't want to necessarily be the one to break the spell i think what we're hearing also from some fools uh, especially fools of color in recent days is they don't want to be the voice of the whole fools of color cohort they're just yeah. one person who has just their ideas based on their experience and so this notion that any one person in a meeting is speaking for any group of people unless that's identified in the agenda or in the meeting invite bring bring the assumption that everybody's speaking for themselves i think my friend well, thank, thank you so much <laughs> jesse this has been an amazing amazing discussion i hope that everybody that is listening takes away the some of these critical thinking questions, being able to learn together. I love the sustainable investigation, but ultimately intentional, integrated, holistic approaches. And it really starts with authentic and empathetic leadership. So thank you both so much. Thank you for everybody who came in. We'll follow up um, with some some of those blogs. Jesse, I'm gonna look for you. Some of the resources, Kate, um, share it out with everybody here. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you. Lily. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I uh, appreciate your, everyone joining. As Lily said, we'll be sending uh, some resources to everyone tomorrow, along with the survey and this recording. Uh, thanks, everyone, on June 10th. Uh, so uh, today, I want to thank you for that. Uh, next week, we're going to have a very similar uh, webinar, a uh, similar topic, but we'll talk more about executive leadership. Love to have you there. The link for that will also be in the follow-up. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you all.